Greetings and welcome to our first introductory section on the relation of the science of physics to theology. Uh, we're doing this at uh, Spirit of Hope Lutheran Church, Parks, Colorado. And this was originally to be on June the 4th, but we had some technical difficulties, so we're re-recording it later. And I hope that you will be able to uh, uh, follow without any problems. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we are always thankful that you have revealed yourself to us through your written word, your son, and through your creation. And we pray that you will help us to better understand all of these revelations so that we can better serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. The uh, idea behind these sessions is to show how misunderstandings of science and misunderstandings of the Bible can lead one to reject one or the other of them and to try to prevent that. Our goal is to improve our ability to win skeptics to Christ by overcoming their misunderstandings and to keep believers from being led away from the true faith by false assertions of a science so-called. For a scriptural reference for this, Romans 1.20, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. God has revealed himself in nature. The psalmist says in Psalm 19, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims, proclaims his handiwork. Before we go too far into all of our discussions, I want to tell you how I got into this in the first place. I'm a person who has a background in both electrical engineering and physics. I've got bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering at Kansas State University, and then a PhD in physics at Texas Christian University. I worked in uh, government labs and also did research with them, and I had a faculty position in the physics department, and then later a faculty position in electrical engineering, I retired from that. Uh, some time back, and at any rate, while I was a physics professor at, uh, or a physics faculty member, I had a friend who was a professor at a graduate seminary nearby, and talking to him one day, I said, your seminary students need to have a background in physics, because they're going to come out and have congregations with a lot of people with technical backgrounds, and in order to communicate with them, you need to understand their viewpoint. You need to understand some of the physics that goes into science. And uh, I said, you really need to have these students take a course in physics if they hadn't had one. And he said, well, how long, how much of a course would they need? I said, well, they should have at least a year. Possibly you get away with a semester. And uh, he said, could you do it in four hours? And he meant four clock hours, not credit hours because he happened to be in charge of a special lecture series they did every fall, and so he invited me to come and spend the four hours in a week, uh, Monday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, an hour each, talking to his seminary students and faculty about physics. So I did, and I titled my presentation, Introduction to Selected Topics in Physics with Comments for the Theologian. Well, they tape recorded that, the secretary uh, transcribed them, and then I spent the next summer editing these transcribed words of mine and putting them into a form that could be written down, adding illustrations and figures to replace the things that I'd drawn on a blackboard or shown as examples, and we came up with this little booklet to which they gave the title, The Relation of the Science of Physics to Theology. It's 72 pages long. It was copied and passed out to all the students and the alumni, and I got a few copies to keep for myself. Well, that was a long time back. That was actually in 1972 when I gave those lectures. Much later, 2015, I'm a member of Ascension Lutheran Church in Rancho Palos Verdes, California, and we decided to make a course out of this for congregation. And so modified it quite a bit to include a lot more scriptural references and to make it something that would appeal to a 
wider, a wider range of people than just seminarians. And so this 10-week session came about. And now it was slight revisions, I'm repeating it here. Uh, the basis for this, from my standpoint, was a textbook called An Introduction to the Meaning and Structure of Physics by Leon Cooper. He's a Nobel Prize winner in physics for his work in superconductivity. And he wrote this as a textbook to be used essentially as a course for seniors in the liberal arts who needed a way to integrate their understanding of culture with science. And so it gives a very good introduction to physics that also has the historical references that go along with it. Now the book, which I realize maybe I didn't have where you can see it, is out of print because of its age. But you can find a revised version of it later, which can be found at least in used bookstores. OK. Well, I did make these lectures in the PDF files now with modern photo setting, And they're on a website, uh, Dropbox. And there's an ebook version as well as a version for printing double-sided. Uh, the Dropbox link for it is kind of long. So if you send me an email to my email address, which is khc at ksu.edu, or get in touch with Spirit of Hope Lutheran Church uh, by sending an email to the church, and we can then get back to you with a clickable link so that it will be easier than trying to type in all that stuff, even if you had it. Now, for the people who are present, I have a handout which has that information in it. And after another handout, that is the uh, front introductory pages from this uh, booklet that I uh, produced so that they could read the introduction to it. So I would invite you to read at least the introduction if you don't read the rest of it. And uh, we are going to have more handouts every week and all the handout materials will be placed in this Dropbox location along with the PDF files that produce these slides that you're seeing so that you can have a re-look at them a second time if you want to. All right, so let's get started. The Bible and science can't contradict each other. Why? Because there's only one truth. If you don't think there's only one truth, then we're going to have a problem of communicating because basic logic requires there can only be one thing true, its opposite is false, and they can't be both true and something that we say is true, and its opposite can't both be true. All right? We're going to find there's no need to be less confident in biblical authority because of what we learn in science. We're going to find out that we don't have to disregard the teachings of science in order to be loyal Christians and believers in the Bible. Science has limitations, and the Bible has to be interpreted correctly. Recognize that both of these, we will get rid of the contradictions. Well, what is science anyhow? Well, you, we usually think of it as something that follows the scientific method. That means controlled experiments, where you do observations, you hypothesize based on those observations, do new experiments, get new results, refine your hypothesis, make more experiments, keep going, keep going in this circle, keep finding out more and more about your subject. Physics is one of the sciences that uses the scientific method very thoroughly. Uh, others like chemistry also do. Other sciences like biology, a little less so perhaps. Uh, and social sciences maybe hardly at all because of the nature of them. But physics is a quantitative science. That means we put numbers to the things we observe and we make formulas involving numbers which we use for our hypotheses. Physics uses words uniquely. We only want to have a single definition for a single term in physics so we do not get confused. For example, the word energy is used by people in general uh, vernacular, uh, like, oh, I'm not feeling very energetic today. Well, maybe you're not, but that's not what the word means in physics. It has a very specific meaning that we will get to later. The word science 
is not always used to mean just physical science or science that follows a scientific method. It gets used on terms like social science. Uh, and why, why couldn't they use a scientific method? Well, because some of the hypotheses you would make would be unethical to test on groups of people. Um, okay, I'm assuming that the people here don't necessarily know a lot about science. Some may and some may not. No specific training assumed. But I am assuming, since we're meeting in a church, that everybody here has some familiarity with the Bible, hopefully having read it recently enough to be able to recall all of the important points. And if that's not true, then that's some homework for you. Okay. The next thing we want to look at is something that's called worldviews. Now, worldviews are not philosophical systems themselves, but they sometimes have the same names as philosophical systems and are closely related to them. The uh, way that we decide what is true is a worldview. And this is something that we all have, whether we are professional philosophers or not. Maybe we've never had a course in philosophy, but we have a worldview. How do we get it? We get it from our culture, from our peers, our teachers, our parents, from what we read, from social media, what we hear on the radio or watch on TV. All of these things shape our worldview. Now, a man named James Sire wrote a book about worldviews. In fact, I think he maybe even introduced this whole subject. It's called The Universe Next Door. It's a pretty uh, hefty book, and it's been used as a textbook for college courses on this subject. Uh, it describes in detail some different worldviews and defines what he means by them. He has seven questions, and if you answer the seven questions, then you define your worldview. The book, called The Universe Next Door, happens to have a synopsis of it, sort of like a Cliff Notes that you can look at, and it's on a website, uh, which I reference here, and which when you access this material on Dropbox, and you can have a click on that to get to the uh, site, where there's a copy going in. At any rate, uh, it's a good way to get a quick overview of what his book is. If you really want to study it, well then, that's another 10-week course at least. Okay. Um, here are the seven questions that are used to establish a worldview. Question number one, what is the prime reality? What is really real? Okay, it's the most fundamental of the questions. Number two is, what is the nature of the external reality, the world around us? Do we see this world as created or autonomous? Is it chaotic or is it ordered? That's the nature of our external reality. What is a human being? Well, that's a really important question. What happens to a person at death? Number five, why is it possible to know anything at all? Hmm. Six, how do we know what is right and wrong? And finally, seven, what is the meaning of human history? If you answer those seven questions, or if your answers to those seven questions were written down, then uh, Professor Sire would put you in one of his categories of a worldview. In the fifth edition to his book, he added an eighth question, and that was what personal life-orienting core commitments are consistent with this worldview. Uh, we're probably not going to worry about that one right now, but. The fact that there's a fifth edition tells you that this is a topic that's been of interest to people. Uh, the first edition was quite early. Um, if I look here on the, the uh, copyright page, I might be able to see when it was. Let's see. The uh, edition that I'm holding is pretty new. Uh, it's the fifth edition of 2009. And it doesn't tell me what the first edition was, but the first copyright was 1978. So that makes it pretty old. Okay, well, by the time you got to the fifth edition, we added another sentence. The worldviews that Sire outlines in his book follow a progression. And they start with Christian theism. We're looking at the Western world, and the Western world from a few hundred years AD until the time of the Renaissance. 
Christian theism was a dominant worldview that essentially everyone held. At the time of the Renaissance and Enlightenment, we sort of drifted into deism, where God created the world and then he let it run and didn't have any more interaction. When we get into the uh, 19th century, the theory of evolution, we have dumped God altogether and we don't need him to create, so we have naturalism. Naturalism doesn't give us any basis for meaning, and that leads to nihilism. And nihilism is not something that one can live with, so that leads to existentialism. And so there we sort of have a fast history of Western thought. If we uh, look to the East, however, Eastern pantheistic monism, of which we have Hinduism, Buddhism, Shinto, Confucianism, the Eastern religions as we think of them, they have worldviews that are quite different from ours. They might, for example, on this business of what's prime reality, and say, well, all of this stuff around us here is just an illusion. It's not real. Okay? New Age is another worldview, which is not new anymore. It's new when he wrote the first edition of the book. But the New Age is kind of a way of mixing the Eastern with the Western in hopes of finding something better. Postmodernism carries that a little bit further. And when we got to the fifth edition, Sire realized that he'd been ignoring a big hunk of the world in this. That is the Islamic part of the world. So he added a chapter on Islamic theism, which is similar to Christian theism, but yet different. Definitely a different view of the nature of God. Okay, well, we're not going to be able to go through all of those different possible worldviews, but we're going to look at two of them. We're going to look at Christian theism and naturalism. And for Christian theism, we're just going to give short answers. Uh, I think it should all be pretty obvious to most of us here that that fits with our own beliefs. What's the prime reality? The prime reality is God. What is the nature of the external reality? Well, the nature is God created it, and he created it in the way that it's orderly, that it has a uniformity of cause and effect, but it's an open system which God can intervene in when he chooses. What's a human being? They're created in the image of God, have an eternal soul. They're not just a biological organism. Uh, Francis Schaeffer pointed out in one of his writings uh, an interesting way to view this is that if we look at humans, we can see that they're related in one way to the animal world. We have physical bodies that function similar to animals. We're related in another way to God in the spiritual world, bearing the image of God and having a soul, so that we are this unique creation. What happens to a person at death? You either enter eternal life with God and God's people or enter eternal separation from God and all goodness. That's a quote directly from James Sire. Uh, some people would say you go to heaven, you go to hell, but it's the same basic idea. Why is it possible to know anything at all? Because one, God gives us the ability, and two, God communicates to us in direct revelation as well as through nature. How do we know what is right and wrong? God sets the standards, the Ten Commandments, and so forth. What is the meaning of human history? It's a sequence of events, linear, meaning it doesn't loop back on itself, a sequence of events that leads to the fulfillment of God's plans. All right, now to naturalism. See how their answer is different. If you happen to have a uh, worldview of naturalism, then matter is eternally existing. There's no God. The nature of the external reality the universe has a uniformity of cause and effect, just as a Christian sees, but it's a closed system. There's nothing out there to mess with, okay? What's a human being? A complex organization of materials, like all animals, but the personality we have is an interaction of chemical and physical properties that are not yet well understood. What happens to a person at death? They cease to exist. How's it possible to know anything at all? Human reason, using the scientific method, allows a knowledge of what is. How do we know what is right and wrong? Well, we really don't in naturalism, but we might have utilitarianism, or saying what is useful is good, or uh, what's good for me is good, or something like that. What's the meaning of human history? It's a linear sequence of events, 
linked by cause and effect, but it doesn't really have a meaning. Okay, so now going on from the idea of worldviews to getting a little bit more into science and how scientists present their data. Also, looking at a term called extrapolation, which we're going to see over and over, as extrapolation is how we get into trouble if we're not careful. You have to be careful extrapolating things. Okay, suppose I'm a scientist and I want to make some measurements, and suppose I have as my measurement I will take is I want to walk along this wall with a thermometer, and every foot along the wall I will stop and read the temperature. That will give me a set of numbers. Now the number that I control is where I am, that place along the wall. The number that I read off the thermometer is the thing I'm observing. And we represent this on a piece of paper as a graph. And I can do it because there are only two numbers here. If I have a lot of numbers, you can't just represent it on a single graph like this. But this is an example. So we have along the horizontal direction a line, and it has numbers on it. And those numbers are the qualitative numbers of where I am along that wall. I could be one foot, two foot, three foot, four feet from the corner, okay? The vertical line has numbers on it. I have zero to 100 there, which is a pretty big range of temperature. But the idea is, whatever the thing we're measuring is, that's along that direction. So I go to a spot out there, and I make a measurement. And I go up to where that measurement is. I go vertical from the place where I have the control value up to the thing I observe. And there, I put a point. Now, a single point would be hard to see, so I make a little plus sign to show it up. Sometimes, instead of just a plus sign, we make bars vertical and horizontal corresponding to the uncertainty of our measurement. That is, I may not know that I'm exactly one foot. I might be off a millimeter or two from that, and I may not know that it's exactly 75 degrees. It might be 75 and a half or 74 and a half. So I put vertical bar and horizontal bars to indicate how accurate my measurement is. Now I forget all these data plotted on my curve. I look at them and I say, oh, I need a theory to explain that. Maybe I had a theory before I even started my experiment that came from some other understandings of the world. But whatever it is, I have a theory which I can represent as an equation, an algebraic equation, which I can plot as numbers. And here I've drawn a curve which looks like a thing called a parabola. Uh, but that is not important right now. The thing that's important is by adjusting the parameters of my theory, I can make my curve fall along my experimental data. Now, it doesn't exactly reproduce it, but it is close to it and sort of taking an average along it. That's called curve fitting, by the way, of making a curve go through your data. And in this region where it goes through the data very well, the theory is valid. So we'll call this a valid region. Now, if I look back at my plot, though, I see that over here, my curve, my data, aren't even close. The theory is definitely not valid in that region. It's invalid. And if I go out here on the right side, I find that I don't have any data at all. That's an untested region. Okay. Oh, and by the way, there's another point over here in the presumably valid region, but it is even, isn't even close to my theory curve or the other points. And that's called an outlier. When something like that happens, you say, must have made a mistake. Maybe I didn't read the thermometer correctly. I should go back and do that one over again. But I'm going to ignore that for now. Okay, that is what you do with outliers. Now, what is extrapolation? Well, it means using the theory curve to get me a value out here to correspond to a situation that I have not tested. So I could say, if I keep walking a little further, the number I would have found for the temperature would have been this one. Okay, but I haven't done that yet, so I don't know if it's true. And this is where we get into trouble. Extrapolation is a valid way to guide one in choosing new experiments. It's valid for making predictions, but you have to realize it might not be true. These points could turn over and come down this way requiring a whole new mathematical formula. And I'm sure we could find a mathematical formula that would make a curve that go around like this and down like this. But we don't have that now, because we don't have any data out here. 
And so we're going to stop where it is. And now, why is that bad? Well, it's not bad, but it's bad if you misuse it. And let me give you an example. The uh, conf conflict between theory of evolution and Holy Scripture, if there is a conflict. What is the theory of evolution? Well, Charles Darwin, on an observation that he made of finches in the Galapagos Islands and other things, he theorized that the way they got their features was because of the fact that a certain kind of bill would be more suited for the finches living here and a different kind of bill would be more suited for finches living over here. And so consequently, the ones that had the bill that was more suited are going to reproduce more and be more numerous there. And likewise, the one of the other kind would be in the other location. And so we have this idea of mutations producing different features in an animal and they would make it either more or less capable of living in its environment and the ones that are more capable will reproduce and take over and the ones that are less capable will disappear eventually over long periods of time. So that's the theory of evolution in a nutshell. But the problem with it is extrapolation and saying that it holds and that you can say all of the world uh, living things are evolved from a single starting point, which is a tremendous extrapolation based on his observations. His observations did nothing at all of that kind. Now, textbook cases you will find, uh, for example, uh, one that's often used is a certain moth in England, which in early days had a light color, and then after the Industrial Revolution, when all of a sudden everything got turning everything gray and dingy, the moths got gray and dingy too. Why? Because they're better camouflaged, and so the predators wouldn't find them as well. Predators will find the light ones and eat them, so they'll die off, and the dark ones, which by accident mutation happen to be coming along, will start to multiply more and they'll take over. And so this is something you can see happening, and it makes a good example. But this is not proving that the same thing could happen to turn a um, reptile of some kind into a bird. You know, that's, that's a bigger jump. And there may be observations of fossils, but they're not experiments. Like I'm saying, you're now doing an experiment to test your hypothesis. You can't test it, so it remains a hypothesis, and it therefore is not the absolute truth, and there might not be truth in it at all, but it's an extrapolation of what you do know to be true. And so extrapolation is okay as long as you realize that it can get you into trouble. Okay, well, I talked too much and my picture disappeared. Now that I'm back to my picture, I want to make an excursion off to another kind of a picture. And uh, this is to talk about some concepts that we use in mathematics, which are really pretty important for our discussions of things later on. And the first one we're gonna talk about is coordinate systems. You've already seen that a little bit with the graph that we had, but you can do coordinate systems for three dimensions as well as two and still look at it on a sheet of paper. And the way you do that is you assign a line along which you have one of the variables, which often referred to by letter X, another line which is imagined as perpendicular to it as going back into the paper, although it can't go back, so it's drawn at an angle, and that's why. Another line that's going vertical that we're calling Z, and so you could plot points on there and represent different things in three dimensions. Uh, these are called coordinates. These were invented by a man uh, named uh, Descartes, so they're called Cartesian coordinates, and they're used a great deal, and we'll be using them in the coming weeks when we're talking about different things in physics. Now, another concept, which is also quite important, is called displacement. And so now we have this three-dimensional coordinate system again, and we're arranging them a little differently. We have X, Y, and Z, but we have the Z coming out toward us instead of going back away from us. And, uh, or I guess it was, it was Y that was going back away from us before Z going up. It's like this thing has been flipped from the previous picture. But at any rate, we have three axes. And along these axes, we have an arrow drawn from the starting point where everything is zero out to some point in space. 
And that arrow corresponds to what is known as a displacement. It has a distance associated with it and a direction associated with it. So a displacement is a combination of two things, a distance moved and a direction moved in. I can say, I live six miles from here, but that's measured on my speedometer going on a road with a lot of curves in it. Or I could say, the displacement from here to my house is five miles that direction, straight line. Sometimes we say as a crow flies, but it's not really the way a crow flies either. It's a straight line between here and there. Okay, that's a displacement. Displacements can add up. <laughs> you can do one displacement, followed by another one, followed by another one, followed by another one. And when you do that, you could see that I could have started out in this particular example, and I could have moved along the X direction from the beginning point to here. And then I could move from here out to here, and then from here up to here, and the sum of those three would give me my final result. Just as, for example, if I got in my car and drove home six miles and drove back six miles, I'd get 12 miles added to the odometer, but my displacement would be zero. I'm back where I started. Okay, well, displacement is an example of what is called a vector. A vector is something that has a value or a magnitude associated with it and a direction. In order to specify a direction in three-dimensional space, you essentially have to have two numbers, okay? And that along with a length in a direction is three numbers, so every vector has three numbers associated with it. And one of the easiest ways to associate those three numbers is in a picture like this to say what's the number of how far you went along the x direction, how far you went along the z direction, how far you went along the y direction, and those three numbers define the displacement. Next time, we'll be talking about some other things, and then it won't be until the third session where we really get into the details of these displacements and speeds and velocities and so on that go with them. So, in conclusion, let's take a look at coming attractions. What are we going to be doing next? Well, the next topic for June 11th is the rise of modern science, starting from Aristotle and going all the way up to Newton. Then we're going to be looking at the details of the development of physics, beginning with mechanics, then heat 